Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel, Warren Kananiga, and you're watching My Life Icons. I'm so excited again today because I'll be doing another first in my channel, and that is to interview my favorite, one of my favorite directors in the USA. And you will know later on why he is one of my life icons. And this is even made more special by the fact that he is married to a Filipina, a Filipina like me. So ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome John Matthews. <laughs> Hi, John. Hi. <laughs> me. Um, I would like to tell our subscribers, our viewers now that the only reason I got to know you is through my niece, Charlie Lizette Brannan, an aspiring teenage actress in the USA. And when I checked her credentials and all, I was really impressed. And I believe that you can tell an inspiring, inspiring story to all those who really want to also follow your career path, which was really an interesting path to take. <laughs> the lawyer turned filmmaker. You know, it's very rare. But let's start with, of course, you're being a West Virginian. So you were born and raised in West Virginia. Um, can you tell us just anything that you want to tell about your home state? <laughs> okay, well, I'm a very proud West Virginian. Uh, we, uh, we seceded from Virginia in June 20th, 1863 to fight on the right side of the Civil War and oppose slavery. So uh, we kind of carry that motto of West, as Mountaineers are always free, like still to today. So I'm you know, very proud of what my state represents. I, I grew up in the country, in rural West Virginia, in this, have you ever heard, heard of a holler? A holler is like a road in between two oh. steep mountains. So it was a dirt road that I grew up on when, when I was growing up and it was called Booger Hole. <laughs> booger Hole, not as in what you think it is, but yeah. as booger as in bad people. So oh. like moonshiners, uh, prostitutes, um, it had like a colorful kind of almost old west kind of history to it so that's where i grew up it was a little tamer when i grew up there um more um you know kids riding their bikes down the streets than than uh, you know anything too wild but uh definitely have family that goes back to the uh the wilder version of it <laughs> so it was it would qualify as infamous it, it's kind of infamous, yeah. It, it's funny, uh, there's a meme that's going around on the internet that says like the most colorful names of, you know, cities uh, in towns in the US and it has one for every state or every region mm -hmm. and West Virginia's is Booger Hole and everybody always sends me that. Easy. Well, relative to, relative to what you just shared to, to us, I can say that West Virginia is really underrated because I checked there are lots of beautiful places in West Virginia. And oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> it's gorgeous. I mean, my, you know, my wife and her family came, I, we got married in West Virginia and, uh, you know, they came out for the first time in, in the fall last year and you know, the leaves, you know, were beautiful and, and um, you know, it's, the, it's, it's all mountains. West Virginia, a lot of states, you know, the Appalachian Mountains go from Maine to Georgia. And a lot of states have a little bit here and there of the mountains that kind of go through their part of the state. West Virginia is all Appalachian Mountains. So it's all, you know, beautiful rolling hills and streams and whitewater rapids. It's, it's a really beautiful place. And you're right, it's, it's underrated. A lot of people don't know about it. Exactly. And uh, you know what? Uh, most people will say their favorite season is summer, but when you're in West Virginia, you will fall in love with fall, with autumn. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And of course, you have a very interesting childhood. I grew up in West Virginia. That's really great. Uh, years after, when did you start having that spark of, or having that passion for for law, for being a lawyer in the future uh, what what motivated you what gravitated you to that profession well you know i guess 
the two parts of my personality. I had this artistic side that, um, you know, I was always the weird kid in, in the back of the classroom, like, you know, drawing and doodling while the teacher's teaching. And, and um, you know, I love to draw, I love music. Um, I always had this really creative kind of artistic side. And then, you know, I always had this, also kind of this um, passion for fairness. And uh, before I even knew what civil rights were, you know, this kind of passion for, for, for things being, you know, like they should be. And, um, you know, I guess as I started to uh, educate myself to go to college and, and um, you know, I studied um, sociology in college and a lot of like racial and gender stratification in society. So that really, you know, set me over the edge as far as civil rights goes. and. And I knew like the only way to make a difference was to, you know, the best way to make a difference, not the only way, but one of the best ways to make a difference was to become a lawyer. Law school with really a calling to, to do civil rights and, and got there and, um, you know, I went to West Virginia Law School, which was a law school def um, that was founded to defend coal companies. So I get there and I'm like, does anybody even do civil rights anymore? Is this, <laughs> you know, cause I grew up, I didn't know any lawyers, you know, I didn't know any other, uh, you know, lawyers doing anything much less civil rights. So, you know, I went there and, uh, you know, luckily one of my professors kind of hooked me up with another um, progressive lawyer in the capital city of Charleston, West Virginia, who um, I guess, you know, kind of mentored me, took me under his wing. That's, that's how I kind of got on the, on the path towards um, civil rights and started out in, in private practice and then was um, assistant attorney general in the civil rights division of the attorney general's office in West Virginia. And then eventually ended up um, as the legal director of the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union of uh, Connecticut. Listening to your answer, I can really say that you are really self-motivated. You did not really draw your inspiration from, you know, other people, but you, you actually draw it from, from yourself. It's really your motivation. But despite that, while you were studying law, were there moments when you found it really stressful or challenging to do your task or the requirements and all? Or you were just really enjoying it because it's your passion? Oh, oh my gosh. Well, you know, I, I go into it and, and kind of the best and worst thing about going into civil rights is that you just kind of get thrown into the fire to begin with, you know, from, uh, you know, a first year lawyer, I was, um, you know, I was in the courtroom, I was, um, I was doing things that, you know, a lot of, you know, my classmates didn't get to do until years and years and years down the line, they were stuck researching while I was, you know, kind of, um, kind of in there doing it. So um, that was the that was the cool part of that. The the, the flip the, the other side of that coin is that I was terrified. <laughs> Moving on to the ACLU in Connecticut and having a little bit more favorable jurisdiction as far as civil rights goes, um, and um, didn't have anything to do with the case as far as. Uh, the work I did, uh, it was before I got there, but got to stand up on stage when the the first um, uh, same-sex marriage case was was uh, ruled in in our favor. So, um, you know, kind of got to be involved in that history with the state of Connecticut before the, you know, the U.S. Supreme Court came down and made it legal for, for everyone. So congratulations, because despite everything that had happened, good and bad, you graduated, and you're able to practice your first passion for seven years in Connecticut. Uh, what do you think made the transition? Oh, of course, after seven years, you had to go to the Big Apple, <laughs> New York State, you have to go to New York to study filmmaking. Can you please tell us the experience? Well, you know, I always had, you know, like I said, I always had this kind of creative side to me. And, you know, even as a, as a, as a, as a lawyer, I was in bands. I was, um, you know, I had a, as a show as a painter and, uh, you know, just, just had this bubbling inside of me. And, um, you know, while I had this kind of calling to do civil rights, I also had this, this passion, this creative passion that, um, you know, really I turned 30 and 31 and, 
thought, you know, I've, I, I've always wanted to, to, to be an artist and, and I'm not getting any younger. If I say I want to do this, I should just do it. And really, you know, film is kind of, you know, it, you know, in my opinion, kind of the predominant art form as far as, you know, how society is moving right now. And that was what I was really drawn to and have been drawn to in a long time. You know, it was in, in West Virginia, I actually saw Spike Lee come uh, to my university and give a talk. And he said he went to New York University, went to NYU. So ever since I saw Spike Lee, you know, Spike Lee was my hero. And ever since I saw him, I was like, oh, I want to go to NYU. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I was a lawyer in Connecticut and I applied to one film school, uh, NYU, the best film school in the world. Mm -hmm. So I thought if it's if I get in, it's a sign. So um, you have to make a short film for your application. And I never made it. I never made any films. Like I was a musician, I was a painter, but I'd watched a lot of movies. So um, I got a camera at Target, and I made um, a movie. I didn't know any actors, so I starred in the movie myself. And um, it was about a young lawyer who was nervous for court. Me. <laughs> and uh, you know, I made the movie, and I showed it to a friend to get uh, you know, kind of a critique before I submitted it to NYU. And they're like, it's terrible. <laughs> so uh, you know, I'd already taken the camera back and got my money back at Target. So I had to like rebuy the camera, shoot the whole thing over with, and then submit it. Uh -huh. And um, you know, I still think they got my name mixed up with somebody else because it's a really common name, John Matthews. Yeah, yeah. But um, I ended up getting into NYU. And then you know, I thought, OK, that's a sign. It's a great sign, but it's very expensive. I already have all this debt from undergrad and law school. You know, what what am I going to do? It's the most expensive private university in America. So the next day, I got a letter that said I had a full scholarship. So oh I'm like, my oh, goodness. full scholarship to oh. NYU. That's a sign. I've got to do it. So um, in August of 2009, I, I moved to, I quit my job and uh, 10, day, 10 days later moved to New York and uh, started film school. Mm. You know what, when you, when you mentioned earlier that if you want to do something, you're going to have to do it. It reminded me of the movie Dead Poet Society, which starred Robin Williams. Have you watched that mm -hmm. film? It also yeah, yeah. Days. <laughs> and my captain was captain. Yeah. yeah, I was supposed to ask you earlier, for, for the sake of those subscribers or viewers, I would like to ask, what's the dynamics in getting admitted into a film school? And you already gave the answer earlier. You said, you've got to prepare something, and they will ask you to prepare a short film or something like that. And of course, your resume and everything. Yeah, the, so it, you know, NYU has a very specific kind of process that it does. Um, and you have to write, um, you had to write a specific, you know, length of dialogue. You had to write a short script and you sh had to submit a, a short film or some example of your work. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, once you did all of that, you had to go and, and you had like an interview process with, you know, the, the chairs of the admission board and the chair of the whole, uh, you know, graduate film program there. And, uh, you know, they basically grill you for an hour and, um, have you come up with stories off the top of your head and scenarios and you know it's it's not really a job interview as far as like where do you see yourself in five years it's more of like they're trying to put your creative mind to the task you know and to task and to really you know kind of grill you as you know as far as like you know yeah you turned in this this work but do you have can you think on your feet oh okay so, so that was the beginning of the career. And you mentioned to me in our previous conversation that your first project was a documentary. Yes. Is that the one yeah. about the one you mentioned earlier about Virginia and your family? Can we yeah. see that in YouTube, or it's not available? Uh, so it was it it was licensed by the Sundance Channel. It uh, it premiered on Sundance and. Um, uh, was on their streaming service for a while. It's kind of in between licenses right now. I could send you a copy of it to, to check it out if you want. But yeah, that was my first film. It was, um, it's called Surviving Cliffside. It's about, um, you know, my cousin who, um, you know, was in a young guy in West Virginia 
who has a, a, a daughter who, um, a seven-year-old daughter who beats leukemia, who beats cancer and makes a run for Little Miss West Virginia. So it's kind of a, you know, a story about the world and the characters down there kind of um, tied into this beauty pageant uh, kind of timeline, I guess. Mm. So it, it ended up premiering at South by Southwest in Austin, Texas, and then went on to, you know, to screen in a dozen or more other festivals kind of across the world and uh, was picked up by the Sundance Channel. And th yeah, that was a thing that, that, uh, that, kind of, that kind of started my career. And I ended up working for Spike uh, my third year at NYU. And then he gave me a grant to finish my first film. Of course, of my, my subscribers career. and viewers know Chalet Lizette Brandon because she gets yeah. on the show and she, she is a you know legend child star now, I should say, and an aspiring recording artist. And mm -hmm. you mentioned to me that you did a project with her. Can you tell us uh, you know some information about it? Sure, sure. Oh my gosh, Chalet is incredible. Of course, I worked with her, it was 2015. So she was, I don't know, she was 10, 9 or 10 then. She was she really young. And, uh, you know, but from early on, you know, I saw her, I think her 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 um, management ended up reaching out to me when I was casting Kali the Killer. Uh, and as soon as I saw her, her reel, I was just blown away. I mean, she was, she's an old soul, you know, she's just like wise beyond her years. And at nine years old, you know, she was the most professional person on set. But what do you consider so far as your biggest projects? Well, you, you, you know, something that comes to mind is, uh, you know, when I was still in film school, it's, it's, it's really funny. When I was still in film school, I, uh, my classmate was James Franco. And James ended up being, um, uh, a professor as well the next year. So I was his classmate and then I was a student. And, uh, it, you know, James didn't come into NYU thinking, oh, I know everything and I'm gonna, ex you know, just tell you everything I know and and um, go on and on and on. No, he came in and said, hey, like, let's collaborate. Let's make a film together. I'm gonna help you out. Mm -hmm. You know, it was just a tremendous, you know, kind of giving, you know, helpful person. And he came in and we, you know, we had a small class of, you know, 10 people or something like that. And we all were gonna make a feature film together, all write and direct this feature film based on a book of poetry called Black Dog, Red Dog by Stephen Dobbins. Mm -hmm. So James came in and um, we wrote the script together and uh, James produced it and co-directed it with, uh, with me and my classmates. And, um, it was it was amazing. Like he ended up getting, uh, you know, in the scenes that I directed, uh, you know, Oscar winner Whoopi Goldberg. So I got to direct Whoopi Goldberg. Uh, James Franco was in it, so I got to direct James uh, and um, Olivia Wilde. You know, uh, who is mm -hmm. man. so that was you know my first big project, and it was, you know, I was still in film school, still at NYU when I got to do it. And uh, you know it's funny. I always I always tell this this story that first first take first uh, time ever working with Whoopi. Um, you know I'm trying to be like super professional. You know I'm trying to show her. You know this yes I am a this is my first real thing I've ever done. But I know what I'm doing. Like this is a professional film uh, set, and we're going to behave properly and you know follow all the rules and all this stuff and before the first take even ended, before I even got to yell cut, somebody's phone went off. So their phone's ringing in the middle of the take and I'm so embarrassed. I'm like, oh my gosh, Whoopi, I'm so sorry. This is never gonna happen again. You know, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna get on to whoever's phone that was and, and give them a piece of my mind. And she reaches down and silences her phone. She's like, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so it was her phone that was ringing. Uh, but she, I mean, she was awesome. She made me feel like so at ease and, um, you know, was just the most down to earth person I've, you know, for, for somebody that's an Oscar winner, that's an icon, that's a legend. She was, she was so down to earth, so easy to work with. And, you know, same for Olivia, same for James. And, 
and uh, you know that was that was a really special experience that you know I'm never going to forget. Mm -hmm. What is your dream project? Let's say an executive producer will approach you, and then gonna ask you, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna finance everything. What would be what project do you like? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's it's really funny because the, really the thing that I'm most drawn to is not the biggest twenty million dollar budget, you know, uh, megaplex movie. I really want to make. I, I have just a really simple story, uh, you know, really low budget. Very, you know, some of my favorite favorite filmmakers. Um, just make these really quiet, really simple stories, really emotional stories. Um, and you know, that, that's, that's really, if I could, you know, instead of having the one $20 million project, if I could get that $20 million and have that as the budget for the rest of my career and just make these small movies where I get to, 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 to have final cut, where I get to make all the creative decisions, I would be the happiest artist, filmmaker in the world. <laughs> oh, okay. So what would really make you happy is when you can actually give 100% all your creative juices in, into the movie, into the projects. Yeah. Do you do writing? I also are screenplay writing. I do, yeah, yeah. I, I, oh. I, uh, I wrote and direct, I wrote and directed um, to Kali and um, you know, I edited, uh, co-edited Kali and co-edited Surviving Cliffside. So at NYU, it's kind of, you know, they're they're different than maybe USC or AFI and some of the, the LA film schools because NYU ha kind of has the indie director track where they teach you to do everything. So, you know, they, you don't have to rely on a studio to, to hire a camera department or to hire an editor. You know, if you have a story to tell and you want to do it on a micro budget, you know, you learn how to do everything yourself. So, um, you know, you, it, which is also beneficial for, you know, you want to get a job as a camera person or you want to get a job as an editor or you want to go and make a commercial. You, you kind of had all those different skills. You truly, you truly are an asset because you're so versatile. Like you're an all-in-one product, a one-stop shop. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for the reference. Uh, and you have stuck knowledge about law, and I'm sure in some of your projects you have gotten inspiration also from what you have learned from your law studies or from your being a lawyer. So that's that's truly great. Got it. My next question is what is your priority or what what do you think is more important? Box office hit or an Oscars? Uh, well, I guess for me, it's, it's it's interesting because the box office hit is really what gets your next movie made. So it, all all the people that are giving you money to make your movie care about is if they're going to get their money back and get a return on their investment. Mm -hmm. So they're looking at your box office. But so you have to have a movie made before you can win an Oscar. So it's it's a chicken and egg kind of thing. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah, for me, I you know I'm more concerned about moving people and people feeling things from what I do and having you know some kind of social relevance and kind of changing people's ideas about the world and how they see people and and um, you know making sure my cast is is diverse and that my crew is diverse and that I'm working with you know the most talented people in in you know all areas of life and you know really really the box office is great because you get to to make another movie the awards are great because they help with that and they kind of um you know um give you validation i guess for what you've your your work you've been doing but 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 really for me it's it's about the joy is in the journey speaking of award not that it matters because it doesn't really matter, but have you been recognized in, in an award giving body? Was there a time or were you nominated? I programmed and co-founded this festival called the Appalachian Queer Film Festival. And, um, you know, kind of one of the biggest recognitions that, that that's important to me because that's something that touches on 
both my activist, social activist kind of life and also um, my filmmaking. You know, so it's something that kind of ties those two together. And uh, Vice Magazine recognized me as uh, 50 LGBTQ activists in 50 states. So I was one of those uh, those that was that was recognized by Vice. And um, our, our film festival has actually been recognized by, we've been you know covered in Huffington Post and IndieWire. So it's this festival that's, little festival that could is what I call it, like the little train that could, we're the little festival that could. And we started out as kind of this tiny little festival and have gotten this nationwide uh, recognition. So I'm, I'm really proud of it and um, I'm really proud of the, the 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 recognition that I've that I've that I've gotten as a result of of it. It's truly really a recognition. It's more than you know going up stage and receiving a trophy and delivering your gratitude speech or thank you speech. That's that's great. And I, uh, you know, considering that I am also a member of the LGBTQ community, you know, this interview is already a part of the celebration. Thank you for being an activist for fighting for our rights. And speaking of fighting for our rights, I am, um, how do you call this? I was a little bit speechless when I saw your profile picture in Facebook. You know, I, I know your home state, West Virginia, is dominantly Caucasian, is dominantly white, a white society. So, um, you know, publishing a profile picture with Black Lives Matter is really, really profound, very deep. Uh, <laughs> how, come, uh, how come you're so supportive of the causes and the advocacies? Uh, you know, I, I, I think it's a deep calling that I don't really understand why more people, most people don't have it. I mean, I don't understand personally how you you can see someone, uh, you know, a community, a, uh, a, someone else suffering or someone else not being treated like they should be treated. For me, it's civil rights has always been a calling and, um, you know, we're, we're definitely, I, I just visited the National Civil Rights uh, Museum in Memphis, Tennessee. It was the site where Martin Luther King was assassinated and you know to kind of see what we've been through in the last 60 70 years in the united states and what all we've done and how we're still not where we need to be um it's going to take a lot more than me yeah that is that is correct i hope that someday well i will not i will not dream of a world where then people are colorblind. I don't want people to be blind of color because I want each person to really recognize that we have differences. But I hope those differences would no longer be an issue at all. It wouldn't anymore be a polarizing topic or something. Married a Filipina, like really a pure Filipina. You know, um, what can you tell about your love story? Just those that you can just share to our Filipino subscribers and viewers. Uh, well, we had a uh, very modern um, romance as far as the way we met. We met on the internet and uh, she's a lawyer and, um, you know, so we had kind of that in common. And, um, you know, you know, it's it's really interesting how much the, the Filipino culture has in common with um, Appalachian culture and West Virginia culture. You know, we both really have strong um, it, ties to family and of course your parents when they get older and that's the way I was brought up too and um, you know it's about it's about families getting together and it's about food it's about uh, you know it's, it's it's really that that kind of closeness uh, you know with with intergener intergenerationally and um, you know just making family you know one of the most important things in your life I agree with everything that you said. In fact, USA is considered to be one of the friendliest countries for Filipinos. We have the same, uh, your first language is English, English is our second language.
but I know your wife is also busy. She's a lawyer, but does she still have time to cook Filipino food? Um, oh, she's a tremendous cook. Oh, yeah, she makes great. Uh, you know, Sisig is my favorite, and uh, wow. her, her mother, her mother too, is an incredible cook. Her whole family, but um, yeah, they get to they get together, and uh, you know, I I can't wait until Thanksgiving. Can you please let our subscribers hear some Filipino expressions or phrases or words that you know? Nakaka intende nagtagala kunte. Just uh, enough to say that uh, my mother in law's uh, cooking the uh, sarap. <laughs> Masarap, delicious. <laughs> yes, yes, sarap. Uh, because your, 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 um, your wife and her family are Tagalogs, like they're in Manila. They're from Manila. Yes. Yes. Uh, they're, 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 um, you're, you're Cebu. Yeah, Bisaya. How did the pandemic affect your life as a director? Uh, well, you know, for the first few months, nobody was doing any production at all. I mean, it was completely shut down. So, um, it, there were, there were no film sets. There were, there was nothing being made. It wasn't until the summer that I really actually got back on set, and um, you know I did a um, I produced and directed a segment for Sesame Street uh, called um, it was Cookie Monster's Foodie Truck. So Cookie Monster is trying to get kids to eat healthy and not just cookies. So uh, he's got this idea that he's going to have them eat beet and watermelon salad. So I went to a beet farm in Kentucky and filmed. Um, you know, a farmer talking about the harvesting process. Um, but definitely smaller crews, masking, sanitation. It's it's really, it's changed a lot and, um, you know, probably gonna be that way for, for some time. Oh, when everything was put on hold, how did you keep yourself busy? What were your pastime activities or I mean, <laughs> did you well, compose songs? I know you know how to play the guitar. I know you're passionate about music too. Yeah, yeah. Well, luckily, I had um, I had some editing projects that that were, you know, that already that had already been shot. I, I, I made a um, I shot a film in Uganda about a Jewish community in northern Uganda, um, and um, it's called Abiyudaya, and I was in the process of. You know, I went there last year, so everything was already shot. So I got to, to work on the editing of that. So that was the big thing that I did. Okay, at least at least there's still something that you have to do that you still at least love and get interested in. So yeah. I'm so happy yeah. that you're already. <laughs> I'm so happy that you're already back on track. And now it's California right now. Can you already go out? You know, dine in. You know, in restaurants. Or well, California has been. It, it was better for a while, but the problem, not just in LA, but really every state in America is um, going into this, this second wave of the pandemic um, with cold and flu season. You know, it's getting colder here. It's getting into fall and winter. So people are indoors more. So it's, it's, it's on track to get a lot worse before it gets better. But I really, really hope that everything will get better soon. I wish yeah. to luck you and your wife for your for your future endeavors. Thank and you. I thank you for the time you have spent with us. Mm -hmm. You, of course, um, granted the request. Thank you very much. And those who are planning to follow your path, <laughs> yeah. I'm sure they have gotten a lot of pointers from what you have shared. And um, I really hope to see you soon, maybe in the Philippines or maybe in the That would be great, yeah. <laughs> I don't know where and when, but I really hope, I really hope I'm gonna, we're gonna meet in the flesh and of course your wife. Thank you very much and have a great day. Bye. Thank you, thank you.